شكرا للجميع لتواجد في القاعة تفصلنا جلسة واحدة نعم. على نهاية اليوم الثاني من قمة المعرفة ونهاية هذه القمة لعام 2017 ندعوكم يعني لمحبي الاطلاع أكثر عن تجربة دكتور فيليب كندي حول تجربته الجراحية في النيورو تكنولوجي سيقوم بإلقاء محاضرة في القاعة رقم ثلاثة الساعة الثالثة وعشرين دقيقة Ladies and gentlemen, for those interested to know more about Dr. Philip Kennedy's neurosurgical experience, please make sure you go to hall number three. أما هنا في القاعة رقم واحد فستبدأ بعد لحظات الجلسة السادسة والأخيرة والتي تتحدث عن الاقتصاد في ظل الثورة الصناعية الرابعة. ومدير الجلسة بكل تأكيد سيكون توم جودوين رئيس قسم الابتكار في زينث ميديا. Of course, last but not least for this hall, for today's session, we'll discuss the economy and the fourth industrial revolution. Topics of this session will be bitcoins, blockchain, e-shopping, and the gray economy, just to name a few. Tom Goodwin, head of innovation at Zenith Media. will moderate this session. Please welcome on stage. Hello everyone. As discussed, I'm Tom Goodwin. Uh, I'm going to be leading this panel and series of short presentations, um, essentially focusing on where the fourth industrial revolution hits the economy. Uh, it's going to touch on two fascinating, very popular areas at the moment. artificial intelligence and the meaning for society and employment, uh, but also technology like blockchain uh, and technologies like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so a very short introduction to each of the guests. Uh, this is Salim Jahar. Uh, he's the director of Human Development uh, Report Office. Uh, we've also got Carl Benedict Frey, the co-director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technology and Employment, and Charlie Morris, the chief investment officer of Newscape Capital. Um, so I think to kick us off, Salim, I think you've got a few words uh, which you wanted to kind of introduce the panel with. Good. Could I use the lectern? You may, yes, go for it. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, good afternoon. I'll just kind of set the stage of the discussion that's going to follow for the next uh, few minutes or more than that. I think when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and we try to relate it to the question of jobs or work, um, the jury is still out there. On one hand, we think that with that fourth industrial revolution and automation, jobs would be lost. But at the other end, there are people who believe that even though some jobs are lost, there will be new jobs created. So nobody knows what the net effect that would be. So in that particular context, I think wherever we go, we come across three specific questions. Some people ask, so am I going to be employed? Some people ask, am I going to keep my jobs? And if it is a younger person, the question would be, when I grow up, what kind of job would I have? Now, these are very basic, simple questions, but they represent complex realities. These are fundamental queries, but they also represent some concerns. These are questions of today, but they also reflect the aspirations of tomorrow. Now, in the context of those questions, let us put on the table five facts. We are discussing or we are referring to these questions in the context of five issues. First, globally today, there are more than 200 million people who are unemployed, of which 74 million are young people. So youth unemployment is a global problem, but it is also a problem, particularly in this region, as we have heard again and again. With regard to the women's labor force participation, it is still very low. We are not still valuing the issue of unpaid care work. Second, When we talk about the jobs, we also have brought in the concept of work. 
because there are certain kind of activities which are not jobs but which are work which basically contribute to human development and to humanity the creative work the work of the volunteers 1 billion around the world they actually enhance human well-being so i think it is in the context of the jobs and work that we have to refer to some of the questions that i have um, already put forward third the technological revolution is taking place at a breakneck speed particularly the digital revolution in the united states it took 50, 80 years for half of american households to own a car but it took less than 10 years for half of american households to own a cell phone so that tells you the kind of the speed with which technology is taking place fourth the nature of work is changing the content of work the approach to work the whole question of how we organize our work are changing there we have shared economies we have crowdsourcing we have also uh, the personalized services we don't need offices or office space to do the work you can do your work from starbucks or any other kind of cafes the kind of the interactions that we have have also changed and finally in the context of fourth industrial revolution automation is taking place lots of us think that automation is still a concept for the developed economies that's not true it would be very much relevant to the developing economies as well if you take the garment industry in parts of asia automation will take place and will take a lot of the work that the garment workers are now doing so i think the implications of those need to be um, thought about so what is happening and what is going to happen the first thing is happening is that if we look at the structure of employment it is basically at the middle where we are losing the jobs it is also at the bottom of it where we are losing the jobs the high quality jobs with good technical skill the demand for it is increasing and the labor market for it is is global so there has never been a better time to be a highly skilled worker there has never been a worse time to be a worker with low or no skill second because of this extreme positions with regard to work and employment inequalities are increasing and this kind of divergence in work is also contributing to inequalities today the latest estimate is that the top 8 billionaires in the world own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of humanity so in other words each billionaire is worth 462 million people so if this kind of the divergence in the job markets go on then inequalities also would become a problem the third sometimes we are very much concerned about the quantity of job but i think increasingly the issue of quality of job is also important the quality of job in terms of your own satisfaction the quality of job in terms of your living the quality of job in terms of human interactions with others are also becoming more and more important the fourth point is that there will be certain jobs which would be vanishing and the prediction is that by 2025 half of the jobs that we know today would no longer be there at the same time the prediction is that in the united states for example 68 percent of children who are in elementary school their jobs have not been discovered as yet and it is often said the children who have not been born as yet their jobs have not been invented as yet so therefore there will be jobs that will be vanishing the jobs at the middle the jobs which re regard routine work and that kind of thing that would be vanishing but there may be new jobs created in conclusion the kind of the skill that the future workforce the future generation would need i would say they would need five c's and three l's five c's they would need creative thinking they would need critical approach they would need collaboration and cooperation they would need connectivity and finally they would need citizenship of the globe because they would be 
global citizens. The three else that they would be need, needing, they would need lifelong training, they would need language, as many as they can learn, and finally, they would need a life-work balance. And that would make human development as well as human well-being really work. And at the end, we may be at a situation where the kind of the tensions that we are thinking in the context of fourth revolution would not be a tension, but would be a kind of a creative collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. In particular, it's great to get some kind of positivity and optimism about what we can do about it. I know, Carl, I know this is an area you've been studying for quite some time, and I think you've got some thoughts to share uh, based on your research recently. So it'd be great to see some of the material you've been working on. Thank you, Tom, for your kind introduction. Thank you um, for the invitation. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the research we've been doing at the Oxford Martin School, where we try to understand how technology is reshaping the world of work and what that means for the future of income disparities, what it means for the future of productivity, what it means for the future of geographies, because fortunes tend to shift in response to technology shocks. What I would like to do with my 10 to 50 minutes is I would like to give you an overview of how we see that the labor market of the future might look like. I would like to give you an overview of the type of jobs that we think will no longer exist in a few decades' time and what that means also for the workforce. Because there is a widespread belief that because of the expanding scope of automation, there will no longer be sufficient jobs to go around in the future. I believe that that is a false prediction, but I also believe that there is a lot of evidence suggesting that many workers are actually losing out to automation, and that has been a prime driver of social unrest recently. If we can get some slides up, that would be extremely helpful. Fantastic. So, um, this very discussion is something that has been with us for quite some time. And I think the great scientist, Frederick Soddy, summarizes the debate quite nicely by saying that civilization is pursuing two precisely opposite goals at one at the same time. On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, it invents new methods of abolishing labor. On Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, new labors to relieve the consequent unemployed. If we go back historically, there can be no, uh, there can be no doubt that we've been enormously productive on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Few in this audience will know anybody who has worked as a lamplighter, as an elevator operator, as a switchboard operator, or as a laundress. And just looking at the occupations that have disappeared over the past century hugely underestimates the transformation that has taken place. Imagine taking a farm labor in a country like the United States from 1900, dropping him into the, today's farm. He will, for the first time in his life, encounter milking machines, electricity, GPS technology, tractors, automobiles, and computers. It will probably take years to train him. And I would go as far as to suggest to you that in the advanced world, nearly all jobs that existed 100 years ago have today already more or less disappeared. Despite this enormous transformation, though, there seems to be more jobs than ever. And some people suggest that this is a puzzle. But I think it's important to note two things. First of all, the entire upsurge stems from female labor force participation and the mechanization of the household, which actually allowed women in the first place to enter the labor market and take on more self-fulfilling tasks. 
The second tendency, what you can see, is that male labor force participation has consistently traded downwards, which is consistent with the intuition that men had a comparative advantage in physical work, which has gradually been taken over by machines, and women have had a comparative advantage in social and cognitive work, and also, not surprisingly, you find women uh, to be more uh, uh, present in computer-related occupations. So we're seeing that women have gained enormously from automation over the past century, men recently not so much. And you can also see that the downward trend in male uh, uh, labor force participation has actually accelerated, particularly since the age of computers of the 1980s. And that is surely no coincidence. First of all, two trends um, explain this fact. The first of all is the declining cost of computer and the fact that computer technologies constitute potentially cheaper and cheaper substitutes for human workers. The second part of the story is that the uh, uh, span of tasks that computers can perform has expanded enormously in recent years. If we go back a hundred years and a distinction between humans and computers was essentially meaningless. Computers were humans. It was an occupation mainly performed by women doing basic arithmetic and tabulating the results. That work was taken over by electronic, electronic computers gradually from the 1950s onwards, but computerization was largely confined to routine rule-based activities that can easily be specified in computer code and therefore readily automated. But what we're seeing now is that for the first time in history, computers are able to learn themselves without human instruction. By feeding them data and information, they can identify patterns better than we do and are gradually improving upon us in a variety of domains, including medical diagnostics, translation work, document review, trading, and, and also we're increasingly finding applications of the big data approach in mobile robotics. Autonomous vehicles wouldn't be feasible unless we had big data to guide the vehicles um, along the roads. Despite this enormous expansion of the potential scope of tasks that automation can do, we believe that there are three key bottlenecks to automation that we should focus on when we educate people, because it's in those domains that the human workers hold a comparative advantage. And those relate to social intelligence, creativity, and the perception and manipulation of irregular objects. If you take complex social interactions, I think the state of the art is best described by the Turing test, where chatbots trying to convince people or human judges of them actually being a person. And some people argue that there was a breakthrough last year when one chatbot managed to convince 30% of human judges of it actually being a person. But it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old boy speaking English as his second language. And if you think about the variety of much more complex social interactions you do in your daily jobs, we try to persuade people, you negotiate deals, you assist and take care of customers, you manage teams. All of these things are far away from being potentially automatable. And the same is true with creativity, the same is true with tasks that require the navigation of unstructured environments such as a home. And unfortunately, I believe that the automated cleaning lady or the automated cleaner is one of the last things that we're actually going to see. So what does this mean for the future of the labor market? Or to phrase the question slightly different, how intensive are jobs in tasks that correspond to these bottlenecks um, of automation? In the US context, and we find similar shares for most advanced economies, um, roughly 47% of jobs are not very intensive in such tasks meaning that they are potentially automatable. And automatability is no longer just confined to production and back office work. It spans across 
logistics, transportation, warehousing, construction, retail, sales and services. Nearly every domain you can think of is now to some extent exposed to automation. And if you look at the developing world, these shares are even higher. That is simply because many uh, low-income countries have specialized also in low-skilled work that have been automated away uh, in advanced economies um, a long time ago. But obviously this doesn't mean that the automation is going to happen overnight. As you all know, a variety of factors drive decisions to automate, including relative costs between capital and labor. When Nissan produces cars in Japan, it relies heavily on robotics. When it does exactly the same thing in India, it relies heavily on cheap labor. But it's also clear that the abundance of cheap labor is becoming or is deteriorating as a comparative advantage. We see this already in countries like India, China and Brazil, where manufacturing employment has already peaked well below 20%. In the West, it once peaked above 30, close to 40%. So even in those countries, manufacturing is becoming increasingly automated. Now, what does this, all of this mean for the future? Some people have taken our findings to suggest that, well, since 47% of jobs are automatable and might vanish, there's going to be widespread technological unemployment. Such predictions are nothing new, and if you go back to the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes predicted roughly that. And he was quite accurate in his assessment of automatability, because what he was saying is that because we can now ag uh, automate agriculture, mining and manufacturing, there will not be, not, uh, there will not be much work around uh, for us to do, so we can simply retire and enjoy our leisure. An extraordinary fact to my mind is that we have become eight times or our wealth or income has increased by 800% over the past century. The amount we take out in leisure has gone up by 10%. And the reason for that is essentially that most of us are greedy. We are very happy to work a few extra hours to do, do those hot yoga classes, to go and travel around the world, uh, to go to nice restaurants, and if we had wanted to, back in 1930 when Keynes made his prediction, we could have automated all that we did back then, essentially away. We could work until April to keep that living standard and take the rest of the year off. And the reason that we haven't done that tells us something. We are very happy to work to be able to afford new goods and services. And as long as there are things that computers are not able to produce for us, involving complex social interactions and creativity in particular, I suspect there will be enough jobs to go around. The prime concern, I believe, though, is that workers are no longer reaping the benefits from automation. You can see that compensation was roughly tracking productivity for a century, even before the days of labor unions. And that has changed since the computer revolution primarily of the 1980s, where technology has increasingly taken the form to substitute for workers rather than complementing the skills. And if we look at the structure of labor markets, and this is, again is for advanced economies, we're starting to see similar trends in low-income countries as well, we see that middle-income jobs have been the ones disappearing. Workers with a college education have done quite well, they've shifted into better paid jobs. But the substantial fraction of the population without a college degree, they have traded down. They are primarily employed in low-income, low-skilled service jobs. They have lost out to automation. The same is true if you look at areas that have uh, adopted industrial robotics more intensely. In those places you can see that net employment has even actually declined simply because those workers no longer have the skills required for new type of jobs that are emerging. And this is nothing entirely new. We've been here before. Uh, maybe the prime event in our history actually mirrors the trends that we're seeing today in many respects. Because 
The Industrial Revolution was a a time of tremendous change, but it was also a time when workers lost out to automation. The displacement of the artisan shop with the factory meant that male workers lost out to women and children taking their jobs in the factories. And as you can see, in terms of economic trends, uh, they largely mirror what we've seen since the days of the computer revolution. Falling share of labor income, stagnant median wages, workers not reaping the benefits from technology. And it might be helpful to actually look, put this into historical perspective, because what happened during the Industrial Revolution? Well, it was the prime event in history because it allowed mankind to escape the life that Thomas Hobbes referred to as nasty, brutish and short. But in the short run for most people, life got nastier, more brutish and even shorter. What began with the construction of the first factories and ended with the construction of the railroads also ended with the publication of the Communist Manifesto. Revolutionary technologies bred a lot of political revolutionaries along the way. And a puzzle to economists and economic historians is really, if people didn't benefit from the Industrial Revolution, why did they in the first place actually accept it? Well, the simple answer to that is that they did not. There was riots after riots. And how did the British government respond? They respond by sending in 12,000 troops to squash the riots. The army that Wellington sent in uh, against Napoleon in the uh, uh, Battle of uh, uh, 1808 was actually smaller than the one he sent against the machinery rioters. Um, And obviously this time around there is a key difference. In many countries workers are today also voters. They no longer vote with sticks and stones. They can simply show at the general elections. One recent study that we did a few months ago suggests that if a robot exposure in the United States would have been 2% lower between now and the last election, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania uh, would have swung in uh, favor of Hillary Clinton leaving her with the majority in the Electoral College. Now, I'm obviously not suggesting that workers opting for Donald Trump said, well, I lost my job to automation and therefore I'm going to work opt for Donald Trump. What it shows is that people that lose out to technology are more prone to opt for radical political change and that was what he represented. And you can see that across countries. And I don't, by any means, believe that this is something that is a U.S. phenomenon. If we look to low-income countries, the exposure to automation is even greater. And if we believe that people on low incomes losing their jobs has the potential to create social unrest in the advanced world, we should be worried about the uh, developing world as well. All in all, I am for progress, and I believe that technological progress is the only way that we can achieve higher material civilization. But we need to make sure that the ones that lose out to automation along the way are also protected. Otherwise, I think that this fourth industrial revolution is going to bring a lot of social unrest as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carl. So, Charlie, as our kind of resident economics expert, um, you know, I, I get pitched all day long uh, with companies that are offering solutions based on blockchain. It seems to be the, uh, the cure to all problems. Uh, so especially when regard to kind of automation and artificial intelligence in the workplace, are there any particular kind of use cases that you're seeing at the moment which are interesting to you, Charlie? So, um, firstly, thank you for um, inviting me in. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there, are two, there are two things happening in blockchain. The first is private blockchain, and the second is public che- blockchain. Public blockchain was invented, well, all blockchains were invented by Bitcoin, which is public. 
Now, it became a very fashionable view two or three years ago to say, I believe in the potential for blockchain, but I don't like Bitcoin. <laughs> and what that meant was that you're a supporter of the private blockchain and its, and its usefulness. And what it really is, is a protected and secure database that enables um, value to be transferred over the internet. And that's an incredible idea if you think about it. Because when you, when you go back and say, well, we want to have this idea of money um, on the internet, historically, it's always been a reference to some kind of central database, like a bank um, or some gold in a vault or other assets, um, whatever you like. And the internet was merely communicating what was there. But there was a central party. And in this case, we don't have a central party. And the whole point of blockchain um, really is, is to enable a decentralized mechanism to exist. Now, to your question, which is essentially about the useful applications of private blockchain, well, actually, people recognize that this database is clunky, requires more energy, and so on. So there are youthful um, cases coming, for example, uh, ticketing. I don't know if you're aware, but if you're selling uh, tickets to a, to a major event, in the modern, like, a, like a pop concert or a sporting event, in the modern world, there are many, many resellers um, which come into the process. And by using blockchain technology, you're able to control the process from, from, from one point and have multiple resellers that you've never met before whilst eliminating the um, potential for fraud and for um, aftermarket transfers uh, which are unauthorized. And so there are lots and lots of things that are, the, um, that are going on in the private blockchain world. And indeed, that is what the boom is um, in, in, in the ICO world. Um, the ICO world um, initial coin offerings is very similar to what we saw on the internet in the late 1990s. It's highly speculative. There are no profits. It's, there are big dreams, but a lot of people are having a lot of fun, and, and I think that something great will come out of it. In the same way that the internet stocks of the 90s, most of them died, but the internet became very, very real, um, and now we don't even notice it ticking away in the background through our lives. I think blockchain is very, very similar um, in that regard. There's a lot of hype about uh, blockchain. Lots of people are saying to me at the moment, you know, it's a bit like the next internet. Um, and when the internet came along, everyone assumed it was a force for good. It would create lots of value directly. And in some regards, while it's happened at the same time as the global economy has grown, in some ways it's actually removed some value from systems. So do you think a technology like blockchain will be kind of net positive in terms of whether it's productivity gains or economic gains, or will it almost become a kind of leveler that removes so much efficiency, it becomes quite difficult to make profit? Well, I think the, the, the private blockchain, again, you're referring to, is, is something that does attack the middle man. And so, you know, the guy sitting in the middle taking a commission, linking buyer to seller, um, that, that is something that the, 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 the blockchain really doesn't, doesn't like too much. So um, in that sense, it's not good for, for everyone, particularly the, the, particularly the, good, the, the middle men. But of course, that's good for society because it, re it reduces the cost of doing business, which makes us all more productive. So I think in that sense, um, it is a good thing. And also, generally speaking, technologies don't become adopted unless they are productive and useful. Um, useless ideas usually um, fade away. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. I'm aware the time is flashing. Um, but there is so much said about this technology, and often the people that appear to have the biggest voices or the greatest microphones seem to know least about this technology. Um, so is there anything you want to clarify or a personal opinion that you want to get out there while you've got a big stage um, in terms of correcting misinformation or making some kind of prediction for the future? Yes, I think that it's worth talking about Bitcoin briefly. Um, firstly, to understand what it is. If, if you consider that the Internet's done a lot of things over the last three decades in terms of uh, becoming powerful in retail, in media, um, in other industries. So in this case, Bitcoin is just the Internet having a go at money. So if you, don't, if you bet against Bitcoin, you're really betting against the Internet's attempt to create value, which I think is uh, you know, not a very good idea. The second point I'd like to, I'd like to make is, is that the price of Bitcoin um, is directly proportional to the size of the network. So I'm going to say that again because it's the most important thing that I have to say. The price of Bitcoin is directly proportional to the size of the network. And that network, how to measure it, generally means the number of people or the number of transactions or, the, most importantly, the amount of value that's changing hands. 
So at Newscape, we've, we've got a fair value model for Bitcoin. And right now, that's um, $9,200. Um, and the price of Bitcoin in the market is $8,250. It's very popular to say that Bitcoin is a bubble and it will collapse. Now, it's quite possible that it will collapse. But that's only if the network collapses. So Bitcoin is not a bubble in the sense that people buy it and push the price up. There's a bit of that. There's not much of that. More importantly, the size of that network, which is growing every, every day, every month, every year, um, we now see $2 billion change hands every single day. And three years ago, that was more like $200 million, the last time we saw the price of $1,000. Indeed, this year, we've seen the price of Bitcoin up eight times and the network grow nine times. So betting against Bitcoin, cryptocurrency and so on is to say that these networks are temporary and will not um, grow in the future. If you take the opposite side of that and say, I think they'll grow a very great deal from where they currently are, then the price of Bitcoin has got plenty of room to rise further. I think we're going to have to cut it short there. It's a real shame. These are amazing questions uh, to ask right now. I think everyone always feels like they live in the most fascinating time in civilization. The change has never been so fast as it is today. Um, but these discussions are amazing to have, and it's a shame to end it there. Uh, but my sense is that we have to go now. So thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you very much, Salim. Um, it's been great to have this conversation with you all. ندعو الحضور للبقاء في مقاعدهم حيث بعد لحظات سنبدأ بمراسم الختامية لقمة المعرفة لـ 2017 Ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you stay in Hall 1 as we have one final event remaining which is the closing ceremony.